Iowa versus Christian Bahima Rivera. Cases being held in Scott County. We are in the presence of the jury. Representing the state of Iowa in this matter is Powashik County Attorney Bart Claver. With him is Assistant Attorney General Scott Brown. The defendant, Mr. Bahima, is personally present here in court today, along with his attorneys of record, Jennifer Fries and Chad Fries. The record should also reflect that we have two certified interpreters, both of which were previously uh, On the record, they were sworn in to be the interpreters in this case. First order of business this morning is I would turn to the state of Iowa and ask at this time that the trial information be read and then also the defendant's plea to that charge. In the Iowa District Court in and for Powersheet County, State of Iowa Plaintiff versus Christian Bahina Rivera, Defendant. Criminal number FECR 00822, Trial Information. Come now Bart Claver as Powersheet County Attorney and Scott Brown as Assistant Attorney General and in the name and by the authority of the State of Iowa accuse the Defendant Christian Bahina Rivera of the crime of murder in the first degree. Committed as follows. Said defendant, on or about July 18, 2018, in Powersheet County, Iowa, did murder Molly Tibbetts in violation of Iowa Code Section 707.1 and 707.2, subsection 1, subsection A. A true information. Defendant entered a not guilty plea to the charge. Thank you, Mr. Clay. Members of the jury, Throughout the course of this trial, you will be hearing witnesses testify about events which form the basis of this action, and exhibits may be received as evidence. Since you as the jury are the judge of the facts, to better enable you to understand the evidence and the testimony as it is received and apply it to the law, at this time, the court will preliminarily instruct you on certain matters. You are instructed as follows. Instruction number one. The defendant is presumed innocent and not guilty. This presumption of innocence requires you to put aside all suspicion which might arise from the arrest, charge, or present situation of the defendant. The presumption of innocence remains with the defendant throughout the trial unless the evidence establishes guilt beyond a reasonable doubt. Instruction number two. The burden is on the state the defendant is guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. A reasonable doubt is one that fairly and naturally arises from the evidence in the case or from the lack or failure of evidence produced by the state. A reasonable doubt is doubt based upon reason and common sense and not the mere possibility of innocence. A reasonable doubt is the kind of doubt that would make a reasonable person hesitate to act. Proof beyond a reasonable doubt, therefore, must be proof of such a convincing character that a reasonable person would not hesitate to rely and act upon it. However, proof beyond a reasonable doubt does not mean proof beyond all possible doubt. If, after a full and fair consideration of all the evidence, you are firmly convinced of the defendant's guilt, then you have no reasonable doubt and you should find the defendant guilty. But if after a full and fair consideration of all the evidence in the case or from the lack or failure of evidence produced by the state, you are not firmly convinced of the defendant's guilt, then you have a reasonable doubt and you should find the defendant not guilty. Instruction number three. In considering the evidence, make deductions and reach conclusions according to reason and common sense. 
Facts may be proved by direct evidence, circumstantial evidence, or both. Direct evidence is evidence from a witness who claims actual knowledge of a fact, such as an eyewitness. Circumstantial evidence is evidence about a chain of facts which show a defendant is guilty or not guilty. The law makes no distinction between direct evidence and circumstantial evidence. Give all the evidence the weight and value you think it is entitled to receive. Instruction number four. Decide the facts from the evidence. Consider the evidence using your observations, common sense, and experience. Try to reconcile any conflicts in the evidence, but if you cannot, accept the evidence you find more believable. In determining the facts, you may have to decide what testimony you believe. You may believe all, part, or none of any witness's testimony. There are many factors which you may consider in deciding what testimony to believe. For example, number one, whether the testimony is reasonable and consistent with other evidence you believe. Two, whether a witness has made inconsistent statements. Three, the witness's appearance, conduct, age, intelligence, memory, and knowledge of the facts. Four, the witness's interest in the trial, their motive, candor, bias, and prejudice. Instruction number five. The court attendant will hand out notebooks and pencils. That is because you as jurors are permitted to take notes during the trial if you want to and have your notes with you during your deliberations. You are not required to take notes. You should not do so if you think that note taking might distract your attention from the evidence or the testimony of the witnesses of this case. On the other hand, if you think taking notes might better focus your attention on the witnesses and the evidence, or might better help you recall what went on during the trial, you may feel free to take notes. You should remember that your notes are intended only to help you with your memory. They should not take precedence over your own independent recollection of the evidence. The notes taken are not evidence. Whenever there is a recess in the trial, please leave your notebooks and pencils on your seats. They will be left there during short recesses and they will be collected during overnight recesses and luncheon recesses and retained by the court attendant. At no time during or after the trial will anyone, including myself, look at any of your notes. At the end of the trial, after you have finished your deliberations, I will ask each of you to give your notebooks to the head juror. The head juror will then give your notes to the court attendant who will destroy them immediately after you have returned your verdict. If you wish to make use of your notebook, please write your name on the first page and begin taking notes on the second page. If you don't want to take notes, just write your name on the first page and place your notebook on the floor by your seat. At the end of the trial, I will also instruct you as to the law of the case as it applies to the evidence. The court, by instructing you at this time, does not mean to imply that these are the most important instructions or that they will be the only ones given to you. Rather, they are given to you preliminarily to help you understand the evidence as it was received during the course of this trial. Dated this the 19th day of May, 2001, by myself, Joel D. Yates. Carrie, at this time, if you could hand out the notebooks and the pencils.
Thank you, Kerry. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, at this time, the attorneys will have an opportunity to make opening statements. In doing so, they may explain to you what they believe are the issues in the case and what they expect the evidence will show. The statements which they now make and the arguments they will later make after all the evidence has been received is not evidence and may not be considered by you as evidence. Also, any statements that they make about the law is not to be considered as the law of this case. Since evidence often comes in piecemeal or out of chronological or logical sequence in the trial of the lawsuit, the statements of counsel are merely to put the facts in perspective. They are intended to give you a thumbnail sketch of the case and outline the evidence to better aid you in understanding the issues and the evidence. Therefore, please give them your complete and full attention at this time. <laughs> 